Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Much for this nice introduction, Sebastian. I guess I'm the first speaker to start late here. Um, so, um, machine learning is transforming our society. Cool. If, uh, um, if you think about areas like uh, language processing or computer vision or um, robotics, they're all permeating our daily life more and more. Um, but in particular, they do use um, machine learning techniques to produce impressive results on tasks such as speech recognition or object detection or autonomous control, to just name a few. And why do we get those impressive results these days? Well, we do get those impressive results in part due to algorithmic improvements, but also um, because of the huge amount of data that we have available these days. And indeed, taking everyone's devices into account, we all together took more than one trillion pictures in the first half of 2015. And this number is astonishing because it means we took more pictures in the first half of 2015 than we took in the entire photographic history until 2015. And that underlines an incredible growth rate. But similar growth rates can also be found for other data sets, such as YouTube videos, Facebook content shares. Here at Microsoft, you probably care more about the number of Skype conversations, or in the scientific area, um, ImageNet data set, Pascal VOC data set are just two of them. So what do we want to do with all this data? Well, we want to extract information from data. But importantly, we want to do so as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Um, but this process these days is not at all efficient. If you ask a machine learning PhD, PhD student about the most tedious part of his or her job, she or he is going to answer quickly, without thinking much, annotating data. After having annotated the data, we typically spend a lot of time thinking about or formalizing, parameterizing the problem. And while doing so, we better also keep an eye on two important optimization problems in machine learning, being the, one being the inference and the other being the learning part. So what do I mean by annotation, parameterization, and optimization? When annotating data x, we're interested in assigning that ground truth, S, from the set of all possible output space objects, calligraphic S, that best describes the observed scene. Let me make this very clear. Suppose we're given as our input data X an image as illustrated on the left-hand side. And we're interested in finding the faces of the walls as well as an object. Now, a possible ground truth for this task is shown on the right-hand side. And I guess you can imagine that it took quite a while to actually come up with this picture. And importantly, we spent all this time only to create this data set D, which contains pairs of input data X and corresponding ground truth S. Now, clearly, going forward, we want to spend less time on, on this particular problem. So one important challenge that we need to solve in the future is how do we better extract information from unlabeled or weakly labeled data. Now in the second part, the parameterization part, we, um, we are typically designing functions f. Functions f that measure the compatibility, the fitness between a um, hypothesis s and a data point x. And those functions f depend on parameters w. Importantly, there's a huge, a wide space, a very large space of possible functions out there. To give an example, the function f could be a linear function, where we're taking the inner product between the parameter vector w and some handcrafted feature vector f theta. Alternatively, it could be a shallow model, where we are first transforming the data via function f2 before we're measuring the fitness um, to the hypothesis via another function f1. Or it could be a deep model, which is very popular these days. Now, one of the challenges in that area is how do we design those functions 
how do we do so effectively without much human interaction, particularly if we have data from multiple modalities from different sensors? Now, a third, the third part that I mentioned is the optimization challenge. Um, two important problems are the inference problem and the learning problem. In inference, we are interested in finding that output space object S star that maximizes over all possible output space co uh, configurations calligraphic S, this fitness function, this scoring function F. And the second problem um, that is very related is how do we find the parameters W of this uh, fitness function? That's known as the learning task. And in this particular um, problem, we phrase it as an optimization problem as well. And the challenge in this area is how do we deal with the huge amount of data that we have available these days, as I mentioned before. And this is exactly what I want to focus on in this particular talk. I want to first look at the inference problem. And I want to show you how to solve inference and graphical models in a distributed way. Before we are then going to turn our attention to um, the learning problem, where I'm going to show you how to combine deep learning with graphical models. So why is this inference problem? Finding S star, the output space object, that maximizes over the set of all possible output space configurations calligraphic S, our scoring function F, such a problematic task. Well, if you think about the motivating example that I um, showed you, the image where we're interested in finding their faces, it turns out we need roughly 50 to the power of 9 3D configurations uh, in order to discretize the 3D space in a reasonably dense manner. Now, clearly, searching over all those 50 to the power of 9 discrete configurations one by one, meaning computing 50 to the power of 9 um, scores, F, is not feasible. Which then means the question is, how do we perform this inference task, this optimization problem, effectively in large output spaces? And how can we do so in parallel? Um, the key observation that we are making is that Oftentimes, we are not interested in predicting a single variable s, but rather are we interested in, in predicting a set of variables s sub 1 through s sub n. Now, why is this such an important observation? Well, using this observation, we can assume, and it turns out to be true for many applications, that our, um, that our scoring function f of s, which is in fact a scoring function that depends on s sub 1 through s sub n, decomposes additively into a sum of more local scoring functions fr, each depending only on a subset, on a restriction, on a region of variables sr. Now, um, throughout this talk, I'm going to assume that the variables s are discrete, which then means that those local scoring functions fr, f12 in the example on the slide behind me, are nothing else but arrays, lookup tables, with a bunch of numbers stored in them. In this example, f12, uh, that 11 and 12, and so on and so forth. For visualization purposes throughout this talk, I'm going to draw ellipses for each and every local scoring function. And within the ellipse, I'm going to write the scope of this particular function. Now, let me make this very clear um, by looking at an example. And the example I chose consists of three local scoring functions. One, depending on two variables, S1 and S2 jointly. And two, each depending on one variable, S1 and S2. For this example, I'm also going to assume that the variables S1 and S2 both only have two states, two possible um, choices. Now, what I want to show you is that the inference task shown on top of this slide is equivalent to an integer linear program. And to show you that, let me introduce variables B. And in particular, I'm going to introduce one variable b for each and every array entry. So the total amount of array entries is two values for the function f1, two values for the function f2, and four values uh, for the joint function. And the corresponding introduced variables b on the left-hand side. If we now multiply the introduced variables b with the corresponding uh, function entries and maximize the inner product, we don't quite get what we'd like to have. We need additional constraints. Um, what do we want the variable speed to do? Well, we want the variable speed to select entries from those arrays. 
So we better require them to be either 0 or 1. Importantly, we want the variables B to only select a single entry per array. So we better make sure that the variables B are properly normalized. Now there is one more constraint that is missing. Suppose I told you what entry you have to pick for the more global scoring function. From this information, you can deduce what entry you have to pick for the more local scoring functions S1 and S2 in this example. And this property is known as the marginalization property. Don't worry about the precise mathematical form shown on the lower right hand side of this slide. What I want you to keep in mind is that I'm drawing edges between regions between which we want this marginalization property to hold. Now here's the program again. It's a linear cost function subject to linear and integrality constraint. Hence, it's an integer linear program which is NP hard to solve. So how can we address this task? Well, let me rephrase this problem a little bit. Instead of using the inner product notation, I'm going to use the sum notation. Now, instead of explicitly um, writing down the marginalization constraint in this talk, I'm just going to refer to it via its name. I combine the non-negativity constraint with the normalization constraint by saying that the variables B are local probabilities. And if we now throw away the integrality constraint, we end up with what is known as an LP relaxation. Which then means we can at least approximately solve the inference problem using a standard LP solver. So why am I standing up here making such a big mess about an inference problem that we can approximately solve via an LP solver? Well, it turns out if you try this for reasonably sized inference problems, you'll quickly realize that standard LP solvers are slow. Which means we need specifically tailored algorithms. Algorithms that take advantage of some structure within the problem. And what is the structure? that we can take advantage of in this problem? Well, I think you're all guessing it right. It's the graph structure defined via the marginalization constraints. Um, think about a bigger graph with a few sparse edges here and there. This is exactly the structure that many, many message passing solvers are taking advantage of. They are very, very effective because they look at those edges. They optimize with respect to variables defined on those edges. And they do so by solving a small subproblem to global optimality. And then they keep iterating over those edges. Now, there is a small issue here, which is um, we need to take specific care to make sure that we obtain the globally optimal solution of the LP relaxation. I don't want to go into the details of this particular issue. I'm very happy to discuss this offline, though. I want to rather get back to the question that I posed initially. Now, since we know how to at least approximately solve the inference task. How can we do so in parallel on multiple machines? So let me make this goal a little more precise. What do we want to do? Well, we want to um, optimize the LP relaxation objective. We want to leverage the problem structure defined via the marginalization constraints. We want to distribute memory and computation requirements. That's the question that I posed initially, but importantly, we want to maintain convergence and optimality guarantees of existing solvers. Meaning, if I take my problem, my graphical model, split it across multiple machines, solve it on multiple machines separately, I want to get the same solution that I would get if I would solve it on a single machine. How do we do that? Well, we can do that by making use of the dual decomposition extension of message passing solvers. Let me show you the intuition behind this. Uh, weird sounding sentence. So suppose we are given a problem like the one illustrated on this slide, where we are having a, um, eight scoring functions, each depending on one variable, and then locally connected via pairwise functions that depend on two variables. Now, instead of explicitly writing down those pairwise functions, let me just denote them by edges. So I did not change the function structure here. The only thing I did was I am not explicitly characterizing the pairwise functions. Now this looks very much uh, like a Markov random field that probably many people in here are familiar with. What I want to now do is I want to take this Markov random field, I want to solve it on two machines, kappa one and kappa two, as illustrated on this slide. 
Um, so what do we do? How can we do this? Well, earlier we introduced those variables b. We're going to do the exact same thing here. But importantly, we are only going to introduce a variable b on a machine if that function, say as a function f1, is also um, allocated or partitioned to that particular machine. Which then means there's already some distribution with respect to memory going on here, right? A variable b1 is never going to show up on computer kappa 2. However, there is some regions, uh, like the one connecting variables 2 and 3, or the one connecting variables 6 and 7, which appear on both machines. So upon convergence, we need to make sure that not only the local probability constraint and the marginalization constraint hold, but we also need to make sure that those regions, those variables, B, that are introduced on two machines but are supposed to be identical, are consistent. And that's the additional consistency constraint that we need to introduce. Now, given this intuition, we are ready to state the distributed LP relaxation objective. It's a linear cost function, subject, again, to local probability constraints on every machine, subject to marginalization constraints that have to hold on every machine, and subject to those additional consistency constraints that have to hold on every machine. Now, if you look at this program, you might be wondering where well, that looks like it's entirely decoupled. But obviously, that can't be quite true. The problem was originally coupled, so it still has to be coupled. Um, and indeed, it is still coupled. It's coupled via the consistency constraints. But importantly, it's the only coupling that happens. So the problem is almost entirely decoupled, except for the consistency constraints. And that helps us to derive an algorithm. An algorithm that consists, and an algorithm that iterates two parts. At first, we are um, kind of ignoring the consistency constraint, and we are performing message passing independently and separately on the individual machines. Eventually, we stop. And in order to make sure that upon convergence, consistency constraints hold, we have to exchange information between machines before we then go back, perform some more message passing iterations, and then again um, exchange information. Now, an algorithm with that structure poses a few questions. First of all, um, how does it compare to existing state-of-the-art servers? Question number two, how often do we have to exchange messages between computers? And question number three, to what scale of problems um, can, we, uh, can we go? What, what scale of problems can we solve? Now, let's look at those three questions one by one. When comparing it to state of the art, we compared it to a library for discrete approximate inference, as well as um, to um, GraphLab, now a famous company in Seattle. And what we are seeing here is a, a bunch of baseline methods, as well as our general implementation. I'm showing you here the runtime in, in seconds. And this is more or less to just show that our implementation does something decent. We, we didn't screw up terribly. Importantly, we are also able to get a, a good primal value. Ah, since we are maximizing, higher is better. Now, if we distribute our problem onto multiple machines, we can improve the performance even further while not screwing up the primal value too much. So um, that's a good result, I guess. And going forward, how often do we then have to exchange messages between the different machines? And that's illustrated on those two plots here. So what I'm showing you here is, the, on the left-hand side, the dual energy over the number of iterations. We are maximizing the primal, so we are minimizing the corresponding dual. And I'm going to show you the dual when exchanging information every single iteration, 5, 10, 20, 50, or 100 iterations. And what you can see here is that if you exchange messages every single iteration, the dual converges faster than if you'd exchange messages every 5, 10, 20, 50, or 100 iterations. That's to be expected. But importantly, what this graph does not take into account is the time it takes to actually exchange information between different machines. And if we take the time into account, that's what is illustrated on the right-hand side. We see the dual energy over time. We see that now um, it turns out that exchanging information only every 5 to 10 iterations is more beneficial 
then exchanging information every single iteration or um, higher durations like 50 or 100, which is to be expected. Now to answer the final question, how often, um, to what scale of problems can we um, go? Um, so we looked at a disparity map estimation problem from computer vision where we are given two images. And um, I quickly continue this and then I get to questions. Where um, we're given two images and we are trying for every single pixel to estimate the distance from the camera center. Now, um, well, we, we scaled up this problem and for every single pixel we used 280 states and we had a 12 megapixel image, which means the size of the output space was 280 to the power of 12 million. I guess at least by now you can imagine that using a standard LP solver for, LP solver for a task like this would not be suitable. Um, but due to the 280 discrete states where we were able to get quite smooth disparity maps um, and um, can visualize nice pictures. So with that, I want to conclude the first part of the talk where I showed you how to um, solve this inference problem of finding that uh, the maximizer S star over the entire, um, yeah, where we found the maximizer S star. So there were a couple of questions here. So it looked like from your chart that you really should be setting the number of, the number of how often you exchange information adaptively over the course of. That's, yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, that's uh, a very good strategy that uh, would improve the performance even further. We, we did not look particularly into that, but that's, that's a very good suggestion. What types of graphs do you have some how do you split them? Um, yeah, I should have mentioned that also. The type of problem that we are looking at was um, standard Markov random fields for connected grid graphs, um, just like the ones that I showed you in, in the intuition. And the connectivity between the computers, I also forgot to mention, that is a standard local area connection. And so obviously, um, the graphs that I showed you depend on the connectivity between the computers and, and the graph structure. Um, so you could always design graphs, adversarial graph structures where this type of approach would not work very well. And you could always design uh, graph structures, favorable graph structures, where, where this type of approach would uh, work quite well. Uh, do your communication costs um, account for just passing enough information along each edge rather than passing the whole state to everybody? Um, so, the, so we are essentially, the, the timings I mentioned take into account the entire inference time, which um, accounts for exchanging uh, information between different, the information between different computers that is required. So that's specific variables. Um, that we need to exchange. So we're not taking the entire state of uh, one computer, transferring it to the other computer. We're just transferring specific, um, specific, oh, um, specific problems, uh, speci uh, specific variables between computers, yes. Any more questions? So if there are, sure. Strongly convex. Um, the primary problem is not strongly convex. That's precisely one of the issues um, related to convergence. Um, if it were strongly convex, then there wouldn't be an issue. Otherwise, since it's block coordinate descent solvers, um, uh, you need to pay specific care. Um, this is exactly the point that I mentioned, and I, I'm very happy to discuss that offline on, on how to fix that issue. But yeah, um, strict convexity is, is a good point. Um, so that brings me then to the second part um, of the talk uh, where I try to answer the question how to find the parameters W of our scoring function F. Now um, this is known as the learning problem where we're interested in finding good parameters given a data set D that contains pairs of data X and corresponding ground truth annotation S. If you are looking into literature there are two types of approaches that exist. On the one hand, there are log linear structured models like conditional random fields or structured support vector machines where the scoring function f is typically assumed to be this inner product between a parameter vector w and some handcrafted feature vector f tilde. Um, 
And particularly recently, nonlinear models like conventional neural networks became very important too. And in these cases, the scoring function f is just a general and arbitrary um, scoring function, typically a composite function. Now, what I want to show you is that those two seemingly different frameworks are not so different from each other after all. In fact, that there are two specific cases, two special cases of what we, we refer to as nonlinear structured prediction. Let me show you the intuition of what I mean by that. Um, and to do that, so, uh, assume a simple problem. Suppose we're given an image x, and we are interested in finding the, mo the, the category of the most prevalent object. Now, one way to solve this task is by taking the input image x, passing it through a set of transformation, and predicting a single variable at the top. Now, let's extend this task. Let's go one step further, and let's assume we are not only interested in finding the most, the category of the most prevalent object, but that we are also interested in finding the category of the second most prevalent object. How can we do this? Well, a simple approach would be to design another convolutional neural network, which tries to solve this particular task. So this convolutional net neural network, or whatever function it is, um, might share some parameters between them, but it tries to predict another variable at the output. Now clearly, there is correlations between the most prevalent object and the second most prevalent object. But this correlation is at best taken into account implicitly in this framework. So what we're trying to do is explicitly modeling the correlations between and those um, those two variables via yet another function, f, that I refer to here as another convolutional neural network. So how can we do this? Well, to see that, let's quickly go back to the inference task. Remember, inference was this problem where I'm interested in finding that output space object, a star, that maximizes over our entire output space, calligraphic s, this scoring function f. Now, instead of maximizing um, the scoring function f, I want to introduce the probability of that configuration and then maximize the probability. So let's do that. The probability of a configuration s is nothing else but taking the score f, exponentiating the score f, and making sure that it's properly normalized by what is known as a normalization constant or partition function c. Now, clearly, with that definition of the probability at hand, we can rephrase maximization of f to be equivalent to maximizing p. Now, that can be easily seen because the normalization constant, as the name says, is indeed a constant for all possible output space configurations s. The normalization constant does not depend on the output space configuration s, so we can just ignore it when plugging p into this formula. The exponential function is a monotone function which means we can also ignore it, and therefore maximizing p is the same as maximizing f. Now, with that definition of the probability at hand, what do we want to do during learning? Well, during learning, we are given a data set d. And we want to maximize the likelihood of our training data set d. That's exactly um, that equation that I showed you in um, the outline slide. Now, what is the likelihood of a data set D? Well, we're typically assuming the samples within our data set D to be independent and identically distributed, which then means the likelihood of the entire data set D is the product of the individual probabilities. Now, plugging the definition of the probability into um, this cost function, we'll quickly arrive at uh, the problem shown on the bottom of that slide that we're interested in solving. No magic happened here. The only thing I did was I took an additional logarithm. Now, how can we solve a problem like this? Well, we can just uh, compute, suppose we are starting at a point W. We compute the gradient at a particular point W. We walk into the gradient direction. We recompute the gradient. We walk into another gradient direction and we keep on doing that. So that's standard gradient descent procedure. So we need to know what is the gradient of our problem going to look like. 
Now, taking the cost function, going through a bunch of derivations, again, not very complicated, we'll uh, quickly end up with the gradient. The gradient has an interesting form. It's the difference between two distributions. We're taking and then scaled by a partial derivatives of our scoring function with respect to W. Now, the two distributions are on the one hand, a uh, distribution data, which is zero everywhere, except for one entry, which corresponds to the ground truth annotation, where it's equal to one. And then the second distribution is our current predicted distribution. Now, um, clearly, that makes perfect sense. Suppose we would perfectly predict the annotations, which then means this predicted distribution would be equal to the ground truth distribution, which would then cancel out, which would mean that the gradient is zero. So what do we need in order to design an algorithm? Well, we need to compute our predicted distribution. Then we need to uh, compute the difference between the predicted distribution and the ground truth distribution and scale this uh, by the partial derivatives of our scoring function. So a standard deep learning algorithm then performs four steps. First of all, compute the functions f. Once you have computed your functions f, you transform them into probabilities by exponentiating and making sure that it's properly normalized. Then you take the difference between the ground truth distribution and the predicted distribution, scale it via your partial derivatives, which is typically done via a backward pass, and then you update your parameters w, and then you keep iterating that. Now in such an architecture, what's the challenge? Where is the problem? Well, how do we compute our scoring function f if the size of the output space s is large? And even if we could somehow do that, how do we then compute the probabilities p? And to show you that this, and this is exactly what I want to get into now, kind of showing you a solution to deal with large output spaces. And to show you that this is indeed a challenge, just think back about the motivating example, this indoor scene understanding example, where we had an output space of 50 to the nine um, elements. Clearly, computing the scores for all those elements is not going to be efficient. Um, but the observation was that we are not interested in predicting a single variable, but rather are we interested in predicting a set of variables s sub 1 through s sub n. And we could use this observation to assume that our scoring function decomposes. Importantly, I'm not telling you what those local scoring functions are. Those local scoring functions can be anything. They can be convolutional neural networks. They can be whatever function um, you see or you deem reasonable for your task. But this decomposition assumption is a crucial assumption that is also going to help us in order to design um, a efficient deep learning uh, framework for large, scale, large structured output spaces. So how do we do that? Well, one of the issues was that we needed to compute this gradient. And the gradient was computed as the difference of two distributions. Importantly, two distributions defined on large output spaces. We are summing over large output spaces, 50 to the power of nine elements for each of them. Now, if you plug in this decomposition assumption and go through the derivations, we we'll quickly see that the gradient decomposes. Instead of having two one difference over two large distributions, we're now having many differences over small, small marginal distributions. And that is obviously a lot more effective to do. Now the question is, how do we then compute those marginal distributions PR? Well, that's unfortunately a challenging problem, and we cannot compute these marginals exactly, but we can obtain approximations approximations that are similar to um, the variables b that I introduced in the first part of my talk. We can obtain them either via exactly the same methods that I showed you in the first part of my talk, uh, message passing methods. We can also obtain them via mean field techniques, branch and bound solvers, also sampling techniques. Um, that would be another choice. Now, uh, we went ahead and we implemented this. 
So uh, we came up with a sample parallel implementation where we repeat five steps. First of all, we compute forward, in a forward pass all those local scoring functions fr. After having done that, we use those local for scoring functions to perform inference in order to obtain approximations for our marginals. After having obtained approximations for our marginals, which can be done um, under certain assumptions very efficiently, in fact, uh, we use those to compute the difference between the marginal approximation and the ground truth marginal, and then we scale those via backpropagating. After having done that, we need to synchronize the gradients across different machines before we then update our parameters and we keep iterating. Now, um, how do we deal with a large number of training samples? Well, we, we do what other people have done as well. We use mini batches and we parallelize across different machines. And we deal with large output spaces, and that's different from what people have done by using those structured distributions, this assumption that our scoring function decomposes. Now, how does this perform in practice? Well, to show you that, I'm going to look at um, three tasks. On the one hand, prediction of words from noisy images. Second task, tagging of Flickr photographs. And the third task is this um, layout example that I used to motivate this talk. So for predicting um, letters from noisy images, um, we're given images like the ones illustrated here. And I'm showing you the ground truth on the bottom. The size of the output space in this case is 26 to the power of 5, 26 uh, possible letters for five uh, letter words. And the graphical models we're um, comparing here are on the one hand linear chains, first order Markov models, and then loopy models, which also take into account longer range interactions. The unary functions are multi-layer perceptrons, MLPs, and the pairwise functions are also linear or multi-layer, uh, linear or non-linear multi-layer perceptrons. Now I'm going to show you here the word accuracy for one layer, uh, the word accuracy for a one layer configuration with different parameters for the one layer, as well as the word accuracy for a two layer configuration with different parameters for the second layer. And what we are comparing in this chart is uh, if you're only using a CNN, that's known as unary only, if you're using a chain graph, or if you're using the loopy graph. So first order or second order model. What we can see is across the board, the deeper and the more structured our model, the better the performance. Where with more structured, I mean um, taking longer range <laughs> connections into account. Now, in the next slide, here, I'm showing you the word accuracy, again, for a one-layer configuration and two-layer configuration with different parameters. But now I'm comparing CNN only with a linear pairwise and a nonlinear pairwise. And we see, again, across a set of different parameters, um, nonlinear pairwise functions improve over linear pairwise functions, which in turn improves over not using, um, not using correlations at all, not taking correlations into account at all. Um, so that's, um, that's nice, I'd say. But that's kind of a very um, simple example. So let's make things a little more complicated. And to do this, I change to the second example, the Flickr data set, where we're given an image. And we're interested in assigning tags. So given an image, we, want to, we have a set of 38 tags. And we want to know which subset of tags describes the observed content well. And in this case, we have 2 to the power of 38 possible output space symbols. A tag can or cannot be assigned, and we have 38 of them. The graphical model is a fully connected um, K38 graph. And the unary function in this case is AlexNet, named after Alex Krzyzewski. And the pairwise function is a linear function in this case. And again, we are comparing here only using CNN, which gives us a prediction error of 9.36% to um, train using the graphic, uh, using the CNN to obtain unary features, which are then fed into a graphical model. That's piecewise training, which gives us a performance of 7.70%. And then going one step further and training the whole system jointly, which gave us an error of 7.25%. Uh, the prediction error, is, it, is this a decomposable loss over the text, or is it just you have to get everything right and that's counted as correct prediction? 
Um, no, that was a decomposable loss, zero one loss. In this example. What uh, is the tag here? What's that? What is the tag here? Um, so we are given images, and a tag could be people, female, male. Um, I'm going to show a few actually on, on this slide here. So we're given images like those ones as input. And ground truth tags are shown in the row below. And then the predicted tags are shown in the third row. So um, the implementation does fairly reasonably, I'd say. There is a few obvious um, mistakes. Like instead of predicting C here, we are predicting sky, which looking at the image seems somewhat reasonable. Um, we are missing the indoor tag here, which looking at the image, I wouldn't be able to tell whether this was indoor or outdoor. And I mean, I guess our algorithm is not very romantic. It doesn't know that this is a rose. But what is more interesting than looking at those pictures is probably looking at the correlations that it learns. So for a subset of the tags, like female people indoor, um, I'm showing you the learned class correlations. And what we're seeing is that a tag female is very likely, an image that is tagged female is very likely to be tagged people. Or if you're looking at a tag indoor, then it's very unlikely to be tagged with sky or plant life, which seems reasonable. Now, going forward, I want to also show you some results on this 3D indoor scene understanding task, where we are given a single input image as our data, and we are interested in finding the faces of the room as well as an object. We are assuming that the Manhattan world assumption holds, and then if we use, in this case, handcrafted features like orientation maps, geometric context, or a combination of both, we are obtaining pretty decent performance, I'd say. But instead of looking at numbers, let me show you um, rather what we can use this for. So as I mentioned before, we're given a single image. I should click. I, we are given a single image like the one illustrated here. And what I'm showing you now is on the uh, right hand side, if you're only predicting the layout, and on the left hand side, what do you obtain if you jointly predict layouts and, and objects? Now clearly, uh, predicting layouts and objects reasons more holistically about our environment, which then means we are obtaining a more realistic uh, scene interpretation. So for yet another example here, given this single image, if you only predict the layout, we'll observe clear artifacts, which we can avoid if we are more holistically reasoning about um, the environment. Now, with all that at hand, um, where should we go next? What, what is, um, according to my opinion, uh, important problems that we haven't properly addressed yet? Now, um, what I'm very excited about is um, helping us to extract information from data as efficiently and as effectively as possible. As I tried to outline in the very beginning, there is um, clearly a few issues that we haven't addressed properly yet. In particular, we are, we are getting very good at this task by leveraging huge amounts of data. But these huge amounts of data also help us to reason more holistically about the environment, about our environment. But to reason more holistically, we need to take better advantage of those structured distributions. Now, um, there's a few issues that, as I tried to outline, we, ha we haven't addressed properly, according to my opinion. On the one hand, we need to better take advantage of distributed compute environments. We need to get better at addressing and extracting information from data using weekly or unlabeled data. And we need to get better at designing those functions automatically, particularly if there is multimodal data involved. So let me show you a few projects that, that could be done to go forward in this direction. So for um, taking better into account distributed compute environments, um, let's look at the algorithms that I showed you. Both of them were synchronous algorithms, meaning we had this barrier somewhere in our algorithm where we had to stop to exchange information between machines. Now, this works fine if our compute environment is very homogeneous. However, these days, we're getting more and more into areas where we have heterogeneous compute environments. So we need to bet, get, take better advantage of um, these architectures, for example, via asynchronous optimization techniques. 
Um, also, hierarchically distributed items become important. If you think about uh, applications like, uh, like autonomous driving, where we're having cars that have very weak computation environments and then large data centers, data centers that have a lot more computational resources. Now, um, when getting into uh, weak, learning from weekly label data, there's a few extensions that are possible. They are generally um, try to extend this, these intricate relationships um, that exist between algorithms like Gaussian mixture models and k-means, which are related to each other via small variance asymptotics, uh, just the same as hidden conditional uh, random fields are related to latent structured support vector machines. And those two are in turn related to the Gaussian mixture model and k-means by exchanging the sufficient statistics. Now we can go further and extend this, um, I call this the, the graph of algorithmic relationships. And um, there's a few missing pieces um, that I think are very important, particularly in, in the area of um, investigating Dirichlet process k-means for the structured setting, which hasn't been done yet. Now, um, going forward in the direction of learning functions from um, learning functions automatically, there's also a variety of problems here, some more practical, some uh, more um, theoretical. On the more practical side, I showed you this um, 3D indoor scene understanding task where we are given a single image and we can reconstruct the, the scene. We recently extended that to incorporate data metadata like floor plans to also um, extract inf or reconstruct entire apartments. Now we can go forward and uh, incorporate additional sensors, for example, like gyroscope data, which is readily available in many, many um, cameras these days. And that is useful for better localization estimates or to also um, go forward and use this for prediction of habits in um, smart indoor environments. Now, with that being said, I want to thank my advisors, Mark, Raquel, Tamir, and Ruslan, who have joined me on this journey, as well as the, the many, many co-authors that I was very happy um, and lucky to be able to work with. And so let me briefly summarize. Um, I showed you how to design distributed inference algorithms that um, make use of dual decomposition techniques to parallelize graphical model inference across multiple machines. In the second part, I then showed you how to combine deep learning techniques with inference and graphical models to train systems that we refer to as nonlinear structure prediction. And in the third part, I tried to hint at a few future directions that are all generally related to this theme that I'm very interested in of extracting information more effectively from data. Thank you. wondering how this kind of structured model with relatively small receptive field compared to a non-structured model, basically the scenery potential, with a large receptive field. So in the first example you had, I think each neuron at CNN had access to the, the part of the image corresponding to one digit or one character, right? And they were connected on top. That, that's right, yes. So what if each CNN had access to all the image? Then it would, could kind of do the structural inference inside the neural network, right? Right. In the second example, I think the AlexNet had access to the whole image. Is that correct? That's right, yes. So do you have any like idea how these two extreme cases mixes and what is the right balance? Right. I mean, you're definitely right. And what you're hinting at is, um, to what extent do those um, nonlinear models uh, implicitly um, capture correlations within data? Um, that's a very good, very good question, and there is no obvious answer to that. Um, the, the key point that I want to make, though, is that if you're training uh, neural networks, you're not plugging in, say, a, a higher order loss or a loss that captures correlations between um, um, higher order marginals. You're essentially just plugging in a loss that says, how accurately am I predicting variable one? How accurately am I predicting variable two? But you're not capturing how accurately are you predicting uh, both of them um, jointly. And that's something which can be done with, with those graphical models, which cannot be done 
if you're just using um, neural, neural networks with individual predictions on top. So if the loss is decomposable, like in your tagging example, if I remember right, yeah, that's what then um, shouldn't the base optimal decision rule be conditionally independent? And so the benefits that you have shown, the 2% from your, from your models, where does it come from then? Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. If the loss would be decomposable, then this, um, uh, then it should it should ideally give us the same result. However, um, due to um, us optimizing non-convex problems, we are um, we we actually have no guarantees anymore um, at all, right? So um, what I what I want to hint at is that if we put those graphical models on top, we're actually simplifying our learning problem. Um, we are not um, learning. Um, we are able to um, take information into account more, more effectively. And in a sense, it performs like an additional regularization. And this is uh, where we believe these, these um, improvements come from. So another question to the first part of your talk. So mm -hmm. in your case, you had um, big grid structured graphs, right? So That's there right. you have only have so many options to cut through them, to partition them. Right. Um, but if you're given a general unstructured graph, how would you partition it across multiple machines? Because I, I would imagine that the graph structure itself is not enough information to do so, right? Or to, to do so intelligently. So you would need something more. And how would you do it? I mean, the graph structure in itself, and particularly the potentials uh, on the graph, kind of tell you how, how strongly um, certain regions are connected. So I believe the graph structure, in addition to the um, potentials that you have on your graph, um, are, are quite a bit of information that could be used. In particular, this is all the information that is used during optimization as well. So that should be all the information that you need. Now, um, we haven't uh, precisely looked at uh, what are good strategies for partitioning graphs. We looked a little bit at uh, what could be good possibilities, um, but uh, we haven't quite followed up on, on this direction. Um, and you're definitely right. For the graphs that I looked at, the grid graphs, there it's, it's, it's somewhat obvious how to partition the graph. Um, and it's going to be more tricky if, if you're looking at problems in the area of, say, uh, protein folding, for example, where the graph structure is by, um, by nowhere close to any regular structure. And in those settings, um, finding good partitioning is crucial. We haven't looked at that. We, we assume this as input to our algorithm so far. Um, but we haven't looked at what could be a good meta algorithm that could be put up front to kind of find a good partitioning. But yeah, it's a good question. Um, would be an interesting problem to look at. And is it the, um, operator splitting for distributed stuff? Um, I presume you use the quadratic cost on the agreement between the per machine variables. Uh, no, there is no quadratic cost on the agreement between the um, per machine variables. It's um, what we're doing is we have this consistency constraint, and then we are um, we are forming a Lagrangian. Is it uh, multipliers or Lagrangian? Uh, we just use Lagrange multipliers. We are not using the augmented Lagrangian technique. So the augmented Lagrangian technique would introduce squared uh, losses on them. However, we are not using augmented Lagrangian techniques. So we're just forming the Lagrangian itself, which is a Lagrange multiplier uh, multiplied by the, um, the constraint itself. Um, so there is no squared um, loss or anything of that form. But the, uh, if you go through the items, through the derivations, the effect is um, uh, what's going to happen is that essentially you have you have those um, two inference steps, and then you're exchanging information, and the exchange of information is similar to an averaging procedure. So I guess um, this is what you were um, hinting at, um, and the, when going through the derivations, the results are very similar. of the variational methods that you were using in the first experiments, but some people report problems with the interaction of approximate inference with learning. Could you say something about that? Uh, I didn't get, get the, the second part. With the of? So the interactions of approximate inference and learning. So if you're not exactly solving this inference problem in the inner loop of when you're computing your gradients, then this can cause 
havoc? Are there some reports of that? Or? Right, yes. I mean, that's, that's a very good question. And typically, so uh, oftentimes what I, what I use in my research are these um, convex belief propagation type of procedures, and I use them both during training as well as during learning. And so we are using a consistent algorithm for, um, during both parts. Um, so uh, w where this issue comes in and is more tricky is if you're, say, using um, some approximations, say, sampling techniques um, during, during learning, and then you would use loopy belief propagation during inference. Those would be clear mismatches. And we have seen um, similar issues that uh, using consistency of algorithms during both learning and inference is important, which we, we try to do here as well. Okay, if there are no further questions, then let's thank Alex again. Sure, thank you.